All right, as I make my way from out of my cage back there, uh, open up your Bibles to the book of James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18. And if you're using one of the Bibles that we passed out this morning, it's going to be on the right side of your Bible on page 179, uh, James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And as we've been making our way through the book of James, we have seen really James pressing on the practical outflow of one who loves Jesus. The practical outflow of one who loves Jesus. The practical implications of one who is a true believer. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, what is that going to look like practically in your life? What does the Spirit love to produce in those who are truly His? What is true evidences of saving faith? And we know that true faith is accompanied by good deeds. We looked at that in chapter 2. And then we saw last week, we saw instruction regarding the tongue. We saw instruction on our speech. And James began that section particularly addressing those who teach, right? And, And not just pastors and elders, but any who desire to teach. And the warning there was that not many of you should become teachers because teachers are held to a stricter judgment. There is a stricter judgment for those who teach the word of God. Uh, The teacher better have control over their speech. And this morning, James is going to, as we look at the second half of chapter three, continue his thoughts concerning the tongue by shifting to those who would make a claim to wisdom. Those who would make a claim to spiritual understanding. And what we find is that the warning to those who may want to teach, coupled with the instruction regarding the tongue in the first half of chapter 3, is closely connected to those who also would make a claim to wisdom, to have spiritual insight and spiritual understanding. And so to those who would claim spiritual insight, to those who would look at themselves and conclude, I'm wise, I have understanding, I'm spiritually mature, I'm worth being listened to. I should have a platform. To those, there's specific instruction on how we should think about such a one and what we should look for in such a one so that we might discern where true wisdom actually is found. And so James, starting in verse 13, he asks a question, which is really meant to help us think through any who would make a claim to wisdom and understanding. Have you ever gone to the grocery store to buy fruit and you go over to the strawberry section and you look at the cases of strawberry, strawberries there and you pick one up and you kind of look at it and then you set it back down and you grab another one and you look at it and you find just that perfect case of strawberries. You take it home, put it in the fridge, dinner time, you pull out that case of strawberries, you open it up, you pull out two strawberries only to find in the center It's covered in mold, all hairy and white. You're like, come on, I I checked it. I looked at this. How, why me? (gasps) Why now? (laughs) Now what fruit are we going to eat? The problem is that you didn't check it. The problem is that you looked in the wrong place. You didn't look thoroughly enough. You didn't look and really uncover what you needed to see Within that case, well, this morning, James is going to help us look in the right place so that we might truly identify where wisdom is, where we find wisdom. We need, to, we need to look to the right place. We need to look and identify within each, even our own life and each other's lives, God's standard of where wisdom is found, what wisdom looks like. So James, in our passage this morning, is going to outline a way to evaluate who is actually wise and understanding. Because listen, many make this claim. Many make a claim to be wise and understanding. The reality is, is that not all are. And what we find, as as he helps us, is that your tongue must actually match your life. Your tongue must match your life. James is going to help us look in the right place so that we might know who actually is wise and understanding among us. See, the conduct of your life will actually either confirm or undermine what you profess. 
We looked at that in regards to the tongue last week. The outward tells us what's actually on the inside. So let's look at what God has to say about where true wisdom is found when we evaluate our own life. James 3, starting in verse 13, read with me. James says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to look at this passage this morning, and I pray that as we look at your standard of wisdom and we see your description of heavenly wisdom, wisdom from above versus earthly wisdom, Lord, I pray that we would have soft hearts, and that we would be conformed more into your image, that we would trust your word, and Lord, that we would humbly submit ourselves under it this morning. And we ask these things in Christ's name, amen. James gives three means of testing the claim to wisdom. Three means of testing the claim to wisdom. Uh, carefully evaluate the claim to wisdom is the call for us. Many make this claim. Not all actually are wise or understanding. And so we need to evaluate the claim to wisdom. And this must first start with us evaluating our own claims to wisdom. This passage is not primarily to equip us to go tell everybody else that they're not wise but to help us evaluate our own hearts uh, where we are before the Lord, that we might understand God's standard of wisdom and understanding and the true manifestation of godly wisdom, of wisdom from above. And this, so this morning, we're going to see three means of testing the claim to wisdom. Uh, kind of three avenues or, or three identifiers to look at so that we might understand God's view of wisdom. And so first, the first means of evaluating the claim to wisdom is the grounds of evaluating wisdom. The, the first way that we can step forward in understanding where true wisdom lies is to look at the foundation, the grounds of true wisdom. Where is it found? Where do we look? Where do we even begin in relation to understanding God's view of wisdom? This is the fundamentals of evaluating wisdom, the grounds of evaluating wisdom. This is the starting point. So James begins, verse 13, with a question. Do you see that there? Who among you is wise and understanding? Who among you is wise and understanding? These are very similar terms, but they have slightly different meanings. Wise is the general word for wisdom, meaning a careful application of knowledge to personal living. And understanding is a specialized knowledge, such as that of a highly skilled professional. So when James asks, James asks who among you is wise and understanding... He's saying, who among you spiritually has wisdom and understanding to be able to have insight into knowledge of God's truth and the appropriate application on one's life with skilled precision? When James asks, who is wise and understanding, he's, he's trying to identify, he's trying to challenge us to think through who among us has spiritual knowledge to where we can carefully apply that knowledge to personal living with skilled precision. And it's implied that many make this claim, and this is a claim that could be made with your mouth. Listen to me, I'm wise, I have understanding. Yet it could also simply be demonstrated through your actions. You don't have to simply say, I'm wise and I have understanding to be one who thinks they're wise and understand. To thinks, who thinks they are wise and, and has understanding. 
It can be demonstrated through your actions. Someone may not explicitly state, I'm wise and I have understanding, listen to me, yet they present themselves in a manner that demonstrates they believe they are wise and have understanding, right? In the same way that one doesn't have to be formally appointed to be a teacher, to assume a role as a teacher, and to be accountable for that which they communicate in such a manner? Well, in the same way, you don't have to claim to be wise and have understanding to present yourself as one who thinks they are wise and understanding. And so this claim to wisdom must be evaluated, and James here begins setting forth the grounds of evaluating someone's so-called wisdom. And the grounds are found in the statement, let him show Do you see that in verse 13? Right after the question, who is among you is wise and understanding? James' response is, let him show. Let him show. These are the grounds. Let him show literally by proof. Prove it. You're wise and understanding? Prove it. Demonstrate it in your own life. The grounds of evaluating wisdom isn't found in someone's ability to articulate great spiritual truths and whether or not they have great insight on any particular topic. It's not their ability to have and engage in great rhetoric and to have convincing arguments to persuade. It's your own personal actions. James here says, prove it. Prove it by your deeds. Prove it by the habit of your life. Prove it by the way you live. Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. A trustworthy claim to wisdom and understanding is found in one who is living a godly life. A claim to wisdom is hollow unless there are deeds that prove it. The grounds of evaluating one's wisdom and understanding is their actual life. Thus, each one of us must ask the question, is my conduct, is my conduct free of character deficiencies that would undermine a claim to wisdom and understanding? Is my conduct free of character flaws, character deficiencies that would undermine a claim to wisdom? Are there things in my life that bring reproach, that bring a lack of integrity? Is there undealt with sin or habitual sin that would undermine or discredit a claim to wisdom? James says, prove it, and then tells us what to look for that would demonstrate this. Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. You could say it this way. Uh, Let him show deeds. And what deeds? Let him show his deeds. And by what means is he to show his deeds? Well, by his good behavior. And let him show his deeds with what manner? In the gentleness of wisdom. What James is saying is live the right way with the right disposition. Live the right way with the right attitude. Live the right way for the right reasons. How are you to show your deeds? Well, you do it with good behavior. And what's the attitude driving that good behavior? It's the gentleness of wisdom. The ESV uses the word meekness for gentleness. In the, in the meekness of wisdom. This person who has a valid claim to wisdom, a valid claim to understanding, not only lives consistently with that claim, but they're not proud. They're not only living in a righteous manner, but they're living with a righteous disposition. They're humble. They are meek. There is a meekness to their wisdom, a gentleness. And this doesn't mean they are soft-spoken or that they lack courage. That's not what James is getting, about, getting at when he talks about the meekness of wisdom or the gentleness of wisdom, but rather they are humble. They recognize the greatness of God. They recognize what they deserve in their own sinfulness. They recognize the immense grace of God and all that they would be were, were it not for that grace of God to rescue them from their own sinfulness. 
gentleness, of wisdom, is that the spiritual insight we have to offer comes from a meek-hearted desire to build up and strengthen and serve and love others. When you give insight to others, it it should never be from an attitude or a heart of self-exaltation. There should be a holiness of life and a lack of preoccupation of self. You aren't quick to impart your wisdom because of how it makes you feel, but out of genuine love and concern for others. You may be one who is eloquent, persuasive. You may even have a following. There's people who love to hear you talk, but if your life is not integrous, if your deeds are not good, if you are not humble, your wisdom is not godly wisdom. In the same way as proving your faith is real by showing it in the way you live, wisdom will manifest itself in a right life, a holy life. And the question for each of us to consider is, whatever wisdom, whatever wisdom I'm willing to impart to others is the fruit of what you claim real in your own life. Maybe you can teach, you love teaching, you've read solid books, you've been involved in various ministries and training, you've been equipped You can articulately communicate spiritual truths. Listen, you better be living in accordance with those things you say. Make your wisdom known by actual proof outside of your words. There are people running all around saying, they're wise, I want to teach, using every platform at their disposal to try to gain a following. Is their tongue under control? Are they holy? Is their life characterized by meekness, humility, love? What is the, the grounds? Where, what, what's the starting point for evaluating one's claim to wisdom? What is the starting point for uh, evaluating your claim? to wisdom. It's your life. It's my life. Look at their life. Look Look at your life. So the first means of evaluating one's claim to wisdom is, is the grounds, the foundation, look, looking at one's life. And next, number two, the next means for evaluating one's claim to wisdom is number two, the indicators of false wisdom. The indicators of false wisdom. How do we identify who is wise and understanding among us? Well, we must first look at the grounds of what is wisdom, of identifying wisdom, and then we must also understand what false wisdom looks like. What are, what are indicators of false wisdom? When the claim to wisdom and understanding is empty, verses 14 through 16 shows us what it looks like. James tell us the, tells us the indicators of false wisdom and then tells us about this false wisdom that is revealed by these indicators. That's what we see in verses 14 through 16. Look at verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, we'll just stop right there for a moment. If you think you can teach others, if you think you have spiritual insight, and understanding, but you are holding and cultivating, nurturing, bitter jealousy, you have a false wisdom. James says if, if you have jealousy, that is wanting something someone else has or, or just not wanting them to have it. And not only jealousy, but a bitter jealousy, which is strife-producing envy, Bitter jealousy is where your jealousy is arrogant, defensive, contentious, and the imagery is like a a cactus that's sharp, harsh, or, or like bitter water coming out of a well. 
This is an indicator of false wisdom. What is your disposition towards those who have what you want? Depending on the answer, that might determine or indicate if false wisdom exists in you. James also uses the term selfish ambition, sometimes translated rivalry. This is an attitude that says, I want to get ahead and I will step on you to do it. This person's participation is rooted out of selfishness and self-love. And a person with bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, this kind of person stirs up strife. This kind of person stirs up contention for their own personal gain. And James says, if you have these things in your heart, listen, that is, that is where these things originate from, the heart. And if you have these things in your heart, they will eventually come out. But if you have these things in your heart, James says at the end of verse 14, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This kind of person claims to be able to help others, but deep inside they cultivate and nurture and hold on to or harbor bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. They may look like they are in the business of helping others. But they are driven by self-love, by selfishness, by self-promotion. They are lovers of self. And so to believe you are wise and understanding and to make a claim to this, but to have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition is not simply misleading, James says. It is a lie. If you have these things, don't boast or be arrogant and lie against the truth. Don't say proudly, I'm able to help people. I have wisdom. I have insight. People need to listen to what I have to say. Don't say that proudly because the reality is you are against the truth. Even if what you say is the right thing, if your life does not match it, if you are selfish, if you have jealousy in your heart that is not being dealt with, you are lying against the truth because your life is not matching the very precious truth that you are communicating and expressing. There's hypocrisy there. Don't say proudly you are a help to people when in reality you are against the truth. You are living a lie Stop saying you're wise and have understanding when these things exist in you because it betrays the reality. You aren't wise. You don't have understanding where these things exist. The very essence of the gospel's impact on someone's life is a love for God and a love for others. Therefore, to have jealousy and to have selfish ambition undealt with, unrepented of, is directly in conflict with such a claim to wisdom and understanding. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, wisdom and understanding does not. It cannot. Therefore, a claim to have wisdom and understanding when having those things is to lie against the very truth you're claiming to have insight into. To claim to want to teach, to want to disciple others, but be so preoccupied with yourself, that kind of wisdom is not produced by the Spirit. It's not flowing from someone diligently walking in their faith. And so James goes on to say in verse 15, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above. That kind of wisdom that would proclaim things pertaining to the gospel, but live with a heart of selfishness, of envy, is not from above. It's not from above. It's not influenced by heavenly thinking, but verse 15 is earthly, natural, and demonic. This is sobering. The claim that lies against the truth, that wisdom that is spoken about, is not that which comes from above. It is earthly. 
It is in accordance with a worldly system of thinking. It is natural. It's not coming from the Spirit. Then he says, it is demonic. What? Think about it for a moment. Satan is the father of lies. And when lying against the truth, you are participating in that way of thinking. Those who live in ungodly false wisdom and self-centeredness, they live in a world of their own ideas, their own desires, their own standards. They are their own authority. It is the ultimate self-elevation above all else. This person is arrogant, self-absorbed. And James' words here are strong. It's not that they're just misguided in that moment to to make a claim to have wisdom and understanding pertaining to the things of the Lord and to view yourself as one that needs to impart that to others and yet harbor envy and jealousy, self-will, a desire to elevate yourself, to have that. There is nothing about the spirit in that way of thinking. That is a worldly, natural, and demonic way of thinking. If, someone, if someone's life is holding on to bitterness and selfish ambition, even though what they are saying about God's word may be true, you know that they are, they're not being used by God in the way that he desires to use his people. A good truth by a bad man discredits the integrity of of the message. And while the truth is still the truth, that kind of wisdom that is content to proclaim wisdom and not live wisely is demonic wisdom. It is of the evil, of the curse, and the wickedness therein. When someone is betraying the truth with a phony life, it is demonic. Uh, Not that you're demon-possessed in that moment, but your way of thinking and your way of living is in accordance with that that which is completely opposite of what is true and right and pleasing to the Lord. And then James draws a line in verse 16. Look at what he says. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. James says where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is disorder or instability. There is confusion, disturbance, disarray, and every evil thing. When we enter into jealousy and selfish ambition, listen, nothing is off the table. When there is envy in your heart, jealousy, In your heart, when there is selfish ambition, a heart that has those things present unchecked leads to any and all sorts of evil. Nothing is off the table of what could flow from a heart who is is entertaining, that is entertaining those things. No evil is untouchable. What a terrifying place to be. This kind of wisdom is not produced by faith. It is produced by lies. It is not in accordance with what is from above, but is in accordance with what is demonic. This kind of wisdom can lead to every evil thing. And in consideration of this, how important is it? How crucial is it? Uh, For us personally, if we desire to teach if we desire to counsel others, if we desire to impart wisdom, to first watch and give attention to our own life, to deal with sin, to to pursue holiness. I mean, look at what's at stake. And then to think about our care for one another in the body of Christ. We, we so often have it backwards. If somebody comes 
and expresses a concern in my life pertaining to sin, we view that as, as a personal attack and a hindrance, a threat to us. How could they come and say those things? That's hurtful, that's hard, that's wrong. No, the real threat is if we were left to ourselves with sin unchecked. It's a kindness of the Lord to put us in a body where we are connected with one another, where we can have insight into our lives outside of ourselves so that we can see what we can't see on our own so that we don't harden ourselves to the deceitfulness of sin so that we don't get entangled in sin so that we might grow in holiness so that we might have a disposition and a manner of thinking that is in accordance with the Lord, not that which is earthly, natural, and demonic so that we would be wise, so that we would fear God, so that we would be pure before him. And think about this, how important is it for the church? How important is it for Grace Bible Church that we not only watch a man's talents to communicate truth, but that we watch a man's diligence to live in accordance with that truth? That a man would be faithful. That a man would be content. That a man would be holy. Uh, that he would be a shepherd of his own heart faithfully. That he would deal with his sin well. That he would care for his home intentionally. That he would be consistent in character. That he would be humble in disposition. Sometimes it can feel like having to wait to be in leadership or to teach or to lead is a hindrance to what God should be doing in you and through you. Don't you understand my giftedness? Don't you understand my desire, my passions? Listen, one of the greatest ways your leadership can care for you is to help affirm that the wisdom you have is godly and from above that it's not worldly wisdom. And the reality is, that takes time. That takes time in light of what God's word has to say pertaining to true wisdom. And one of the greatest ways, listen, one of the greatest ways that you can pray for and encourage your leaders is to pray for, the, pray for us and encourage us in personal holiness encourage us in godliness of life, in contentment, in humility. We must be humble. We must be loving. We must be selfless. So we've looked at the grounds of evaluating wisdom. We just looked at the indicators of false wisdom. And next, what we're going to see, and lastly, James is going to show us the indicators of true wisdom. What does true wisdom look like? We've seen the signs of, of what false wisdom produces. What is true wisdom? What does true wisdom produce? And we see that in verses 17 and 18. James told us what it's like when someone has a false wisdom, and now he's going to spell out what it looks like when someone has true wisdom or authentic wisdom, heavenly wisdom, wisdom from above. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. The person who professes to be a Christian must prove it by his works, his daily living. If he is a true believer, he will possess the Lord's wisdom and will be growing in it. In fact, the true believer, when thinking rightly, goes to God for wisdom. We saw this in chapter 1. Uh, turn back there for a moment. Turn to James chapter 1. What we're seeing in verse 13 is not the first time that James has brought up wisdom. But in, in chapter, or chapter 1 verse 5, he says, But any, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so James, in chapter 1, is talking about the believer who's going through a trial. 
And, and is called to consider that trial joy. That one is to go to God for wisdom that they might live the truth of the gospel well in spite and in the midst of the trial which produces external pressures on their life. And as those trials press in on the believer and the rubber is meeting the road on how to live faithfully in the midst of hardship, as you're seeking to navigate that, go to God. Ask God for wisdom that will help you learn, help you understand, help you have insight as to how God's truth must intersect with your life in the midst of that hardship, in the midst of that earthly struggle and trial. The Christian goes to God and is to ask in faith, and God gives generously without reproach. I love this. He, he doesn't hold things against you. He doesn't hold things back from you. He doesn't scold you for not coming to him sooner. He doesn't mock you or belittle you for not having it on your own. He gives you generously wisdom without reproach. This is wisdom from God, and this kind of wisdom, which is from above, impacts not only what the Christian says, but this wisdom penetrates to the core of who you are and impacts how you live. Even in the, the severest trial or the most intense persecution, the believer can know how they ought to conduct themselves before God in holiness and purity because God will impart that wisdom on them. God will help them. What is this wisdom like? You can go back to James chapter 3. What is this wisdom like? What is true wisdom from above like? And James gives us a list. This wisdom that helps us navigate uh, the struggles and trials of life and the daily struggles and fights against sin and the greater hardships that we may face, here's how it looks. Here's what it manifests itself as in the believer's like, life. Here's what true wisdom from above is like. And first, it is pure. True wisdom from above is pure in the sense that it is free from all the things that corrupt wisdom. It is free from worldly influence, from sinful influence. When you can really help someone, when you can really be a blessing to another believer with wisdom, is when you yourself truly possess wisdom and are pure. When you're pure. And this is because you're living a pure life, and so your life is pure and your mind is pure. The well that your words are flowing from is uncontaminated when your heart and mind are pure and you are humble before God. Your conscience is clean. When you are really able to be a spiritual blessing to others, when you can really impart wisdom and guidance that aids people in their faith, it is when your life is pure. But when your life and your mind are defiled, you can't see clearly to impart wisdom on another. How can you help a brother with a speck when you have a log in your own eye you haven't dealt with? Wisdom from above is first pure purity of life. You must be free from contamination or defilement. This word for pure is from the same root word as holy. And this is the starting point of wisdom that is from above, purity. Next, he says, wisdom from above is peaceable. Your participation brings peace. Your disposition has a soothing effect. You promote that which builds relationships and brings and unites people together. You foster peace. You aren't in this for you. Stepping on others, promoting strife. You want to bring peace. You don't view others as pawns to be used for your own uh, selfish agenda. Rather, you are humble, considerate, considerate. You cultivate unity. You won't compromise the truth, but you desire to bring unity through the truth, not division for your own ambition. You foster peace. Wisdom from above is also gentle. It's also gentle. It, a good way to describe this would be that you are considerate. Considerate. You don't go through life viewing everything through the lens of how things impact you but you are mindful of others. You have an eye for others. 
You're not thinking primarily about how every situation impacts you and and what you want to see accomplished. But no, your heart's disposition is that you're seeing needs over here and you you have consideration for someone over here. And when you participate or do something, you're not just thinking about your own desires and what you want to do and how you feel, but you're thinking about those around you. You cultivate unity in that You consider it. You, you think about not only what you're going to say, but how you're going to say it, that you might serve the person in front of you. You put the shoes of others on your own feet. You feel what you know they feel. You are kind in the giving of wisdom. This is kind sensitivity to others. And gentleness is, is, is never a compromise of the truth but it has to be a a humble consideration of the soul you are caring for with that truth. And this isn't in opposition to the times where the wisdom people need may be a rebuke, but your heart is not one that is looking for opportunities to be harsh. You are not looking for trouble. Just give me a reason. You're not quick to sound off on someone. Your default is gentleness, consideration. And even in your rebuke, there's great consideration for the individuals. These these words may be hard to hear and they may merit a harsh tone, but this person brings sensitivity rather than severity. In giving wisdom, you recognize the soul you are caring for in that moment. James says wisdom from above is also reasonable. Listen, you're you're willing to concede where it doesn't really matter. You're thoughtful and calculated about not only what hills you die on, but what hills you fight for. It's not that you compromise what is crucial, but that you're willing to yield where it doesn't matter. You're teachable. You're not stubborn. You're humble. You're willing to listen. You're willing to engage in a reasonable manner. This is wisdom from above. Also, James says, wisdom from above is full of mercy and good fruits. Mercy is compassion. When I give wisdom, I am to have an attitude of compassion. The right thing to hear or do is not frequently the easy thing to hear or do, and there needs to be, a heart, at a heart level, compassion on the implications and hardships that this one you are caring for is feeling in that moment. When I give you wisdom, it comes with compassion and love and care and an understanding that, listen, everyone's first response may not be their best. And so if I bring wisdom and insight, my number one concern is that person's personal holiness. And if they lash out at me, I am merciful. I am patient. I am gentle. I've considered what it would be like to be on the other side of this conversation. And I know the sinfulness of my own heart and how I might respond in that moment. And so when it's hard for my brother and they lash out at me, it's not a personal attack that I I must, must stand up for myself in that moment. No, there's compassion. Oh, there's mercy. I am very well acquainted in that moment with what I have received from a good, gracious, generous God. And so mercy just flows out in that moment. And good fruits, there's just all sorts of good deeds flowing from this person. This person in their heart says, I'm not arrogant before you. I'm not full of pride. I'm not condescending when I speak truth to you. I'm empathetic. I enter into your circumstance, and when I give you wisdom, it comes with compassion and mercy and care and love. And in that moment, as you're caring for someone with wisdom and insight, your holiness doesn't hinge on the behavior or or others or how they receive your wisdom and insight. You You just plod forward in holiness. All sorts of fruit that are good and right. James also says, wisdom from above is unwavering. 
You don't say one thing and live another. What you see and hear is what you get. You're not double-minded in how you live your life. Your story doesn't change. You don't waver because you are genuine. You don't flip-flop. You're not divided. There is no uncertainty. You are sincere and stable. This one pursues what is pleasing to God without conflict. And this flows right into the next, next description where James says that wisdom from above is without hypocrisy. You're not a hypocrite. People don't hear your standard and watch you live another. You are sincere, authentic. Wisdom from above produces a consistency of life. And then in verse 18, James says, And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This verse is worded a little funny. It's a little difficult to translate from the Greek. You could say it this way. The seed, which I believe is the wisdom from above, so wisdom that is from above, that is sown in peace by those who make peace, the fruit of that wisdom that is sown in peace is righteousness. The seed, which based on the context is the wisdom from above, is to be sown in peace. Wisdom from above is to be sown in peace by the one who makes peace, and the fruit of that is righteousness. Think about what James said previously. If worldly wisdom shows itself by selfish ambition and leads to all sorts of evil, every kind of evil, wisdom from above, sown by one who makes peace and is sown in peace, leads to righteousness. This is really the essence of the gospel. When we help people, when we impart wisdom to another, it, it must produce peace with God and peace with one another in the body of Christ. If you sow this fruit that is from above, it will result in people having a more intimate relationship with God and a closer relationship, a more peaceful relationship with others within the body of Christ. Uh, that's the core of the gospel, that God has made us at peace with himself. True wisdom looks to the gospel because only the gospel can bring true peace with God. That has to be the starting point for any wisdom from above. It starts with the gracious, righteous God sending his son to atone for and to pay for our sin. And when we bring spiritual wisdom that produces all of these things that are pleasing to the Lord, when we do that in peace as one who has been made at peace with God, it produces peace, self-perpetuates by the spirit of God and promotes righteousness. As we look at this instruction about how, how to evaluate wisdom and how to think about wisdom and earthly wisdom and, and, and heavenly wisdom, we can't miss the greatness of God in the, in the gospel, who, that he would impart to us wisdom and understanding and spiritual insight and give us the ability to live in accordance with that which is pleasing to him. That is the grace of God. That is the, the glories of the gospel, that is the preciousness of, of our Savior Jesus who would condescend and take on flesh and go to a cross and experience all sorts of turmoil, turmoil, all sorts of wrath, all sorts of judgment. Every individual sin that you committed, Christian, was placed on him so that we might have peace, that we might be at peace with God. And what God loves to do is use his truth and a right understanding of his truth in his people to conform his people more into the likeness of his son to produce greater righteousness. Have you believed in this savior? Have, have you put your trust in this God? You must. Peace before God is available to you. Have, have you felt that my whole life is just turmoil? Everywhere I go, strife finds me. I find strife. It's just hard, hard, hard all the time. Whatever you're feeling horizontally, 
is nothing to the reality of where you are vertically before God if you are not saved from your sins by faith in Jesus Christ. And yet this morning, he offers you peace in him. What a gift. What a gift. As we close, a a few things to consider. What kind of wisdom do you possess? As we've looked at these descriptions uh, of true wisdom, what kind of wisdom do you possess? What would be the testimony of your life? What would it indicate regarding the wisdom you possess? Listen, if if you want to be useful to God, if you want to be a blessing to the body, where should your focus lie? Not on teaching others, not on leading big ministries, not on gaining a follow, a following. True wisdom flows from a purity of life. Pursue greater insight and understanding of God's word so that you might be conformed more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Live in such a manner that you have a clear conscience, peaceful, reasonable, merciful. It is consistent, sincere, genuine. A person like that possesses a wisdom, not of this world, but a wisdom that is useful to God and beneficial to others. It is from above. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your grace. We we could never be this standard of wisdom were it not for your spirit working inside of us. And so, Lord, even in our desire to want to possess wisdom from above, to want to have a life that is pleasing to you, we confess our helplessness to attain that on our own. The goal is not that we just go try harder. Yet we, we need to actively pursue holiness, but we need to do so with humility, recognizing that the only way we can is by strength that you provide. And so God, help us to come yet again to the cross, to the gospel that we would remember who you are and what you have done in rescuing us from sin so that we would be impressed all the more so that our faith would be deepened and strengthened so that we would recognize your boundless love that has conquered our boundless sin and that, that mercy's arms are open wide as we seek to walk in obedience to the truth. I pray that we would be a church that is wise. I thank you for your grace and work in the lives of these men and women who do possess godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom. And I pray that you would help us to increase all the more. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.